Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seat belts. We'll continue with Rich Smith. He'll be talking about novel protection. So give him a nice round of applause. So, who am I? I, uh, I work in the Trusted Systems Lab of Hewlett Packard Research. I'm the lead researcher in their um, Threat and Offensive Technologies project. Um, it's about five people in my team. Uh, it fluctuates with, with the amount of students that we have in at any time. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about some research. It's about a year old now, actually. Um, talking about ways in which we can think, n new ways in which we can think about security, and we're particularly applying it in this instance, exemplifying it with uh, thinking about file format vulnerabilities and how we can uh, address file format vulnerabilities. However, the, um, the actual theoretical basis for the work is applicable across the whole, the whole remit of security. So um, don't just think it as a particular defense against file format vulnerabilities. It is a, it's a technique. It's not a product. So I'm going to start off talking about the problem space which we're thinking about. Um, I'm going to, I was speaking to the EU last week at the EU Commission, and I started with a joke there. And it bombed. Nobody laughed. 600 people out in the audience, not one laugh. I put it down to the fact that they weren't hackers and it was a hacker joke, so they didn't get it. So I'm going to give it another go today, and if it bombs, I'm just going to have to accept it's a bad joke. Um, so there's a hacker, and he's walking down a beach, sees a bottle in the sand, obviously picks it up, gives it a rub. <laughs> out pops a genie. And the genie says, Hey, you, know, you get your three wishes, you know how this works, but uh, you know, I know you're a hacker, uh, so I'm going to put an extra caveat in. You know, whatever you wish for, every other hacker in the world gets twice as much. And the hacker was like, well, you know, three wishes, it's not so bad. So the, uh, what do you want for the first wish? He said, well, I'd like, uh, you know, I'd like a super dome. And the genie was like, yeah, there you go, super dome. It's, you know, it's in your data center, but every other hacker in the world got two super domes. And the hacker wasn't that pleased with this. So he had a little bit of a think. And the genie was like, come on, come on. What do you want for your second wish? He said, all right, I like, uh, I like some vulnerabilities in, uh, in OpenBSD. I want, I want some you know, OpenBSD zero day. Genie was like, there you go. It's on your super dome. But every other hacker in the world, two OpenBSD zero days. He wasn't that pleased with that either. Uh, so the genie was hurrying him. He was like, yeah, I want to get back in my bottle. Um, what do you want for your third wish? So Hacker Science stands there, thinks for a few seconds, and then goes, I think for my third wish, I'd really like to donate a kidney. It's just a bad joke, isn't it? <laughs> but I'll come back to it, because there's a little bit of a metaphor in there. So we're thinking about the problem space. Um, and attacks are really moving, or have been gravitating towards client-side attacks for quite some time now. There was, uh, there was a peak of everybody hacking uh, server-side stuff, you know, when everybody was uh, owning WFPD and, and SendMail. Um, and then everybody thought they had that covered. You know, a lot of people put effort into securing their server-side apps, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, et cetera, et cetera, all your standard security stuff. Um, so people moved towards the unprotected things, which were client-side attacks, and client-side attacks are now rocketing, um, and, and have been. There is, um, you know, it's... It's a prime target for real-world attacks, certainly against governments and corporations. We see um, a lot of them. Uh, some are more sophisticated than others, but they are, you know, they're a very, very real and everyday attack which is used. File format vulnerabilities are an example of one client-side attack. Um, I'm sure everybody here is aware of what a file format vulnerability is. You know, malformed data being processed by a, a uh, client-side program. Um, and if you malform that data in particular ways, you may be able to uh, take ownership of that program. Um, there's been obviously an increase in fuzzing. I'm sure you've heard, all heard many talks about fuzzing. Uh, the, the last uh, couple of black hats, there's been a huge increase. I think at the last black hat in Vegas, there was an entire track dedicated to fuzzing. Um, and file format, file format vulnerabilities are great things to fuzz, fuzz for. You just create a whole stack of files that are malformed in various ways, automatically load them into your program, see how the program reacts, and you, uh, you, know, you, you may or may not find a vulnerability. And there's various fuzzes out there. There's file spike, not file spike, um, file fuzz, various other ones. 
Um, Tugs are different types of uh, different types of file formats, but you can. Uh, you, there's quite a lot of attack surface area there to get to gain hold of. Down at the bottom, there's a few just examples. Um, a couple of the Microsoft ones. Um, the cursor vulnerability was firm because it was a cursor. The WMF vulnerability was. Uh, an example of a flaw as opposed to a bug, so it wasn't like a buffer overflow or anything. It was uh, it was uh, a feature of, of the file format, which was being used in uh, in, a, in a way which probably wasn't expected. Um, it's certainly by no means contained to Microsoft formats. Um, Adobe had a nice one uh, in the PDFs recently, which was uh, a mail to bug uh, for email addresses within that format. And uh, I mean, literally a couple of days ago. The there was, uh, AI released a whole heap of um, FLAC, uh, which is a uh, an, an audio type format. They released a whole host of um, vulnerabilities on that. They were nice. Uh, they were cross-platform because the FLAC libraries uh, work across all the platforms. Um, there's the CVE numbers there if you're interested to go and find out slightly more about them. So. Why are file format vulnerabilities particularly interested, uh, interesting to attackers? Um, we've seen quite a lot of zero days. Um, again, I'm pulling out Microsoft Office, but it's not anything particularly bad about Microsoft. Um, Microsoft Office is only targeted by the attackers purely because it's a ubiquitous format. If you're working in a corporation, everybody has Office on their desktop. So if you want to attack people, um, it, you, you need the reader, you need the client side application there. You're almost guaranteed to have uh, Microsoft Office at the endpoint in a corporation. Um, and the Office formats are quite complicated. Um,
stuff which is looking at behavior you know if you
equivalents. You know, as, as a user, can you use that file in the way that you would have used its pre-transform partner? So you know, uh, images uh, are quite a, 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 good, a good exemplar of this. You know, if, if I had a, a, a JPEG and a PNG, can I, can I do the same things with, with both of them? Uh, if we're talking about going from a Word file to a PDF or a Word to uh, a screen scrape image of that, you know, obviously the functional equivalence is much, much lower because I can't edit. You know, if, if I have a screen scrape of that Word file, I can't edit the file. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's conveying exactly the same information. It's got high information equivalence, but it's got very low functional equivalence. And depending on what use the person receiving that file is going to put the file to, um, maybe they want a higher informational equivalence or maybe they want a higher functional equivalence. And it's entirely depending on their role and how they're using that file. Um, so an example would be if, um, if, if somebody, you know, you, you're collaborating on a, on a, on a project and you're, and you're working on a document, it's, there's no use uh, me changing that file as it's coming through email to you to, uh, you know, to a JPEG image of that file. Um, because you can't edit it and then send it back to the person. So you, know, you need functional equivalents. If you're an intercept officer uh, working on intelligence,
isn't the file which is on the key, it's been transformed and that happens uh, in, uh, in the example is actually in a virtualized, a parallel virtual machine. Um, that the virtual machine mounts the, the disk and uh, the transformation happens in that machine and then it, uh, through a special uh, file system driver um, you, you render the, uh, a different version of that file. We'll go through that a little bit more um, in, a, in, a, in a second. The uh, other couple of usages down at the bottom are really where uh, people are able to uh, fairly freely upload files. So on a lot of social networks you can, you know, you have a a picture of, of, of yourself or, or, or um, say, uh, say photo sharing websites, you know, I can upload object data which people will, will, will look at. Um, it's probably a fairly good idea if you're a host of arbitrary data to uh, do some non-deterministic transformations on that data so if there is anything in there um, you'll nullify it and there's various, um, oh, we won't go into it, but there's various um, interesting laws around uh, if you're hosting the data, are you liable for any damage done by that data? Um, so, and it's a very, very much grey area of the law. Um, it's probably you don't want to be part of the first case law that goes to court. So, it pays, you know, it pays in mind to, uh, to to do transformations on that data and uh, nullify any attacks known or unknown within that. Um, and direct user input devices. I'm thinking of things like. Um, you know, in the chemist where you take your camera's memory stick up and you plug it in the side and it, and it brings up the pictures and you choose which ones you want to print out. Obviously, um, they're just fairly standard PCs running on there. Um, we've shown various examples that we can input memory sticks or whatever into those machines and uh, take ownership of, of them. Um, if you're having anything essentially where the user is supplying data to you, it's probably quite a good idea to perform transformations on that. Um, maintaining the information equivalence to protect yourself because you don't know what it is that you, you know, people are supplying arbitrary data. So this is um, the the example of the which I did have working until yesterday, but I broke it. Um, example of the file system um, driver. So if you were plugging in uh, a USB key or, or a CD-ROM or, or anything, um, so the this, this is kind of the user VM is what you'd normally be working within. Um, the transformation VM is uh, a little tight, uh, quite hardened. Um, it's running Linux at the moment. Um, virtual machine that is only dedicated, all, all it does is transform files. It just doesn't do anything else. Obviously, VM, VM0 is your management um, VM. And I'm not sure are people are familiar with Diffuse file system for Linux. It allows you to write um, file system drivers in uh, user space rather than having to get particularly down into the kernel. Um, and there's various, you know, like Ruby extensions and Python extensions and stuff. Um, so this is all written uh, using the Fuse uh, kernel uh, module, uh, and all the file systems are written in Python. So um, you plug in, for example, your USB stick. The transformation VM uh, hooks the the, um, the 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 USB stack, so it knows when there's been a new mass storage device um, entered into the system. It mounts that; it physically mounts that into the transformation VM, um, and then triggers up th actually through VM0 to the user VM um, like a pseudo. It, 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 it flicks it to, to say that there's been a new USB device, but it kind of um, the user VM doesn't actually really mount that USB device. Um, and then using the Fuse file system driver, um, we, we, the user VM thinks it's mounted the, the USB device, um, uh, but it's actually proxying um, all the syscalls that it would be doing on a normal file system. It's proxying that through over um, uh, XML RPC through to the transformation VM. Um, the transformation VM obviously has a, a, a uh, daemon sitting on it that takes all those uh, requests uh, and then uh, that, that proxies the syscalls which are coming over XML RPC down to the actual real file 